Good morning everyone and welcome to Didsbury Community Church and our online worship time together this morning. Uh, I'm going to be leading us in some song worship again this week and uh, before I get into that we're going we're gonna to sing Lord Reign in Me and we're going to sing Cornerstone in just a second um, but, but first of all I just want to pray um, for this time of worship uh, and to pray for you all as well. Um, yeah, let's let's pray. Father, uh, Father, we come before you and, and we're, we're so grateful that we're still able to worship, Lord. Um, Father, it's, it's, it's what we're made for. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning through the power of your spirit to, to just really unlock uh, what it means to worship you, Lord. Father, this week I was reminded of some passages where, where you're so displeased with empty worship, so displeased with just nice songs and, um, and, and nice singing and, and whatever it is, Lord. Um, what you want is, is the heart there. Um, what you want is for uh, our worship to be more than just empty words, that we might feel and live out our worship to you Lord and so this morning I pray that this wouldn't just be a time of, of singing a song but Lord it would be um, a real time of, of proclamation of your gospel over our lives Lord um, where we where we come to the cross we're reminded of the cross we're reminded of Christ and and we're so inspired and in awe of what you've done for us Lord that we just can't help but worship we can't help but sing and it comes from a place which is so grateful and so thankful um, for you and all that you've done in our lives Lord but that also that that would inspire us to take our worship to 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 ask the spirit into our hearts to make a change to make a lasting change so that we might act out our worship as well Lord that we might be the hands and feet of your kingdom in the world around us as well let our worship this morning not just be about singing and um, let our hearts not be empty when we come before you Lord I pray that you'd help us through the power of your spirit um, to worship you with pure hearts this morning and we pray this in Jesus name Amen First song Lord Reign in Me is, is very much along that kind of that kind of theme that that feeling that we that we're asking God to reign in our lives let's not just sing the words as if they mean nothing just because they're nice lyrics or the song sounds nice but actually that we might sing them and, and pray this prayer at the same time that God would reign in our hearts, that he would He would change our lives for the better, he would push us into, into new and better things. Um, let's sing together.
sing together um, Cornerstone as we remember um, just what it is that makes it possible that we might have this gift of grace, this gift of forgiveness, this gift of eternal life. It is only through Christ and is the cornerstone of our, of our entire lives now once we've accepted him as our Lord and Saviour. So let's sing this song Cornerstone together. on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the flame my anchor holds within the flame Christ the
Christ alone, cornerstone, we may strong be Savior's love, the stone, he is born for you to be the cornerstone of our lives every single day Lord this morning as we get up and worship and prepare ourselves for for the talk I pray that um, that you would sustain us that you would hold us up Lord that that if we're close to you we will not fall <laughs> Lord we long for that closeness give us the strength the stability and the never changing grace that we sing about Lord the never changing grace that means we can stand before your throne faultless somehow. Father, I pray that you would be with David as he speaks to us and shares uh, from another part of Acts, kind of almost like the, the second half of Acts maybe. Uh, we're approaching now, Lord, and I, I pray that you would be with him, give him wisdom, um, and also give us wisdom in our conversations with one another. Let your spirit be involved in everything we do, everything we talk about, and everything we share this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He, the Apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. And this took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover, but while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains before two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed, and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realise it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches, and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, so they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It's the voice of a god, not of a man. Instantly, an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness, because he accepted the people's worship 
instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread and there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. Welcome. As you can probably tell, they've opened the barbers. Uh, when next year students look at the virtual learning resources I've been creating, it'll be very obvious which were created before and after July the 4th. Well, this uh, morning's passage is Acts chapter 12. And before we get into the meaty stuff, I want to just talk about a few bits and pieces to do with the text. An introduction, if you like. But first, let's pray. Lord God, we just ask you that as we come to study your word, as we come to listen, that you would speak, that we would listen, and that you would enable us to understand what this text has to say to us this morning. Amen. So first off, Acts chapter 12 is the close of Acts part 1. It's a bit like a TV show and a spin-off based on a reformed villain. Yes, I did just compare Axe to Xenia Warrior Princess. And while I might be the first to do so, after this sermon gets out there, I'm sure I won't be the last. Well, maybe I will. Anyway, in the first 12 chapters, the main characters are the 12 apostles. And Paul is introduced as the enemy, the persecutor of the church, who is then converted by his encounter with Jesus. Then in the last 16 chapters, yes, like some TV series, the sequel has a longer run than the original. It's all about Paul, with only one crossover chapter where Paul goes to Jerusalem to meet with what's left of the Twelve, as Paul goes to meet them in chapter 15. The first section has Peter as its focus, the last section is all about Paul. But there's more to this split than just the shift in main character. It follows the path set out in the first chapter. In Acts 1 and 8 we are told the mission is to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. While the first 12 chapters are all about Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the last 16 are about the ends of the earth, as Paul works his way around the Mediterranean to Rome. And while it might not be the physical end of the earth, because even then they knew the earth was a globe, it's not even the end of the Roman Empire, with Paul longing to go beyond into Spain, and you can find all, all about that in the book of Romans, and they knew about plenty of other places as well. However, it is the sociological end, from the backwater province of Judea to the heart of the empire, from God's city to the city which is the seat of oppression and opposition. Anyway, the last half of the book is about the mission to the Gentiles ending in Rome. This chapter is also the last we hear about Peter. In Jerusalem, the leadership shifts to James, the brother of Jesus. But why does Acts finish Peter's story with he went to another place? What place? Does the writer not know? Does he choose not to say? Some suspect that Acts was written to be used in Paul's trial in Rome and that Peter had went to Rome and so they didn't want to give away his location. But the truth is, we don't know. Uh, Peter's part in the story of Acts was over, although God had more for him to do. There's also one other significant thing about this chapter. It's uh, one of the pieces of evidence for a bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, stay with me. In some circles, people deny the physical resurrection and try to see resurrection as a nice way of thinking about death rather than the complete reversal of death. When Peter shows up at the gate, they think he's been executed. They think, like James, he's been killed. And it's his spirit or ghost. They use the word angel, but they're, they're kind of the languages of a spirit or a ghost. It's a completely different language to that of resurrection. They don't say, it's Peter's resurrection. Oh, Peter's been killed and he's come back to life. It's evidence that they had words for life beyond death, and it's not resurrection. Resurrection is coming back to physical life. They had an expectation of seeing his ghost, as we might put it. And that's how they talked about Peter. It's not how they talk about Jesus. They use very different language, the language of resurrection, which was completely different. And it shows you that this idea of Jesus' resurrection is more than just a kind of life after death, um, a kind of ghost going beyond his death. Anyway, for the main points this morning, I want to look at three characters in the story, James, Herod and Paul. Firstly, James. Now, this is James, is James, the brother of John. There are quite a few Jameses in the New Testament. Uh, there were two in the twelve and the James who came to lead the Jerusalem church was the brother of Jesus. And he wasn't one of the twelve. The thing we focus on with James is that why did he not merit a save? Peter gets an angel, guards who fall asleep, and he gets all the big rescue. James, he gets a sword. Why did Peter get saved, but James didn't? Well, Peter 
did get saved this time, but ultimately we believe, and from the historical record, we believe he did die a martyr, um, as did at least 11 of the other disciples. So it's not just a case of why didn't God save James as to why God chose to save one here but not the others. It's a question that Christians and others have asked many times down the years. Why does God choose to save some but not others? And one of the lessons that we learn from Acts is that God uses persecution and oppression to grow his church. This is not an accident. It's not even what God can do despite the situation. Jesus won the victory for us on the cross. And he calls his followers to take up their cross and to follow him. God saved us through Jesus' suffering. And there is something redemptive about this unjust suffering. When God's followers unjustly suffer, God is somehow able to turn this into the salvation of others. This was not just the case in the book of Acts. It's repeated in our um, in our history and it's a major theme of Revelation and it's there in other books in the Bible as well. In the midst of suffering and persecution, people are somehow drawn to God. And what can we learn from that? It's this, when things seem to be going wrong, God is still there. And God is able to use the tough times, sometimes more so than the good times. And even if we don't see the good coming out of it for us, maybe God is using it for others. It's not to say we can't try and make things better or pray to God to escape. And most of the chapter is about people calling for God to remove somebody from a similar situation. However, if God chooses not to answer that prayer with a yes, it doesn't mean God's not there in that situation and God's not at work and God can't do great things. The way we react, the way we remain faithful to God can stand like a beacon calling to others even if we don't get to see it. The second character is King Herod Agrippa I. The story of Herod Agrippa I is a story of vindication. Now, I spoke about this a few weeks ago. However, as I chatted with people afterwards, I may not have been as clear as I could have been or thought I'd been about what that actually meant. Vindication is the legal idea of being declared to be in the right. Now, at the moment, as I write this, Johnny Depp is suing the son over claims it made about him being a wife beater. A wife beater, sorry. Now, according to the BBC, if he wins this, he is likely to have spent more money on lawyers and on the case than he will get in damages if he wins. So he's going to go through all this court case and he's going to lose money. So why is he doing it? Because he wants to clear his name. He doesn't want to be known as a wife beater. He wants to be vindicated, to be declared in the right. That's what vindication means. Of course, there are other non-legal usage which echo the same idea. Now, while we would never wish anyone harm, when people who intentionally ignore social distancing, who refuse to wear masks and who break lockdown to have parties, then in, end up in hospital with COVID-19, those of us who stuck to the lockdown, socially distance, wear masks, feel vindicated. We were right to do those things because we can see the consequences if we do not. As I say, we're not trying to wish harm on anybody, but when these things happen, you say, yes, I was right to go through all of that because I got saved from the consequences. On social media, on one social media platform called Reddit, it has a group called Leopards Ate My Face. And uh, the about section says this. I never thought leopards would eat my face, sobs woman who voted for the leopards eating people's faces party. Revel in the schadenfreude any time someone has a sad because they're suffering their consequences from something they voted for or supported or wanted to impose on other people. That kind of reflects this. But it also represents Herod pretty well. I think Herod in this chapter gets a mention in that Reddit group. The one who killed one apostle, arrests another to kill him as well, finds himself on the receiving end of God's justice. On one level, this is a reminder that while God may not be seen to be acting at the moment, while it looks like God's enemies are winning, God has not forgotten. Ultimately, God is just and he will put the world to right. Ultimately, he will find in favour of his followers, no matter what they suffer now. I don't know what circumstances you're facing at the moment. I don't know what injustices you're suffering due to your faith. I don't know what the hardships that you face. But I do know that following God will be vindicated, will be proved to have been the right decision in the end. If not in this life, then in the next. And this story also plays an important role in the story of Acts. There's a reason given for Herod's death and putting it in here at this point in the story as we transition from the local Jewish context to the spread of the gospel to Gentile Rome is important. 
Herod is struck down for accepting claims of divinity from his people, for treating him like a god. And as the book is shifting to Turkey and Europe on the way to Rome, one of the big challenges to Christianity in Turkey is that Christians will not join in the local emperor worship, where the Roman emperor is worshipped as a god. This isn't just a challenge to Herod, this is a warning shot across the imperial bow. This is God saying, I'm noticed and I'm not happy. The way God deals with the Roman emperor's claim to divinity is not the same as Herod Agrippa I, but is no less certain. And I think it's very clear from history who was on the right side of this situation. Finally, we get to Peter, which is where most people focus on in this story. Well, if you hadn't noticed, I'm not most people. But you do have to talk about Peter if you're going to talk about Acts 12. And this story about Peter seems odd. I'm not just talking about the humour. Yes, the Bible has humour. The whole picture of Rhoda leaving Peter, standing at the door while the church prays for him to be released, while he's outside the door knocking to be let in. It's intentionally funny. I'm thinking more about the fact that while everybody seems to be praying, nobody really expects God to act. Now, I've talked before about this attitude of being faithful without faith. Not that we don't believe in God, but that perhaps we don't really believe or expect him to do something in our lives. Clearly, despite calling an all-night prayer meeting, and despite the fact that they're all praying for Peter, they don't really expect Peter to be rescued. But he is. At other times, we're told that stuff didn't happen because of a lack of faith. Didn't seem to be the case here. On one level, it seems like this is because of God's plan. He still has work for Peter to do. So Peter is rescued. On the other hand, it's an act of grace. God is sovereign. It's his power at work. He's not some fantasy book or computer game deity that builds up power due to the strength of faith and number of his followers. God is free to act as he sees fit. He's not limited by us. However, he does often act in response to our faith. There is somewhat of a tension here. But there are a couple of points to think about here. When are we faithful but lack faith? When we pray for God to act, do we really believe that he will? When we bring things to God, do we do it out of habit, out of duty, because somebody told us that we should? Or because we actually believe in a God who will intervene? Now, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes it is a James situation. It might not appear that God is acting, although he is still at work. And sometimes the answer is no. But sometimes it's the Peter situation. God intervenes. Miracles happen. We don't know which of those two situations we are in, but we have to pray to God, believing that he can make a difference. God may not answer in the way that we want, but we shouldn't really be surprised when God acts. The way he acts often does surprise us, but not the fact that he does. We need to live lives expecting God to act, to look for the places where he acts, to recognise them, to normalise the acting of God. When we pray, it's because we know that God acts and we just want him to act in this particular situation or we want to tell God how we would like him to act in this particular situation. It's one of the reasons why we have sharing times when we're together, to talk about the ways that God is acting here and now and normalise and create that expectation that we expect God to intervene. Not to make you feel guilty because he's acting in others' lives and not yours. I don't think we can say that Peter was full of faith and James lacked it. Um, but so that we might build the expectation that God is acting and will act. We might not know how he will act, and it might not even be the way we expect. It might not even be the way we want. But that is the point of prayer, to enter into that dialogue with God about the way he's acting and about how we'd like him to act. And also, the other side of that, how we are acting and how God would like us to act. It's a conversation. You don't always get your way, but God definitely wants your input. He is acting. And the other thing we can learn from Peter is his disappearance from the book of Acts. This is his last mention in the story of the New Testament. He comes up again in some of the letters, but this is his last narrative appearance. It's not the end of his story. We know from history a little bit about what went on afterwards. The fact that God rescued him now is because God still had work for him to do. But it doesn't make the pages. For Acts, it's over. How often do we want to be noticed? How often are we happy when God uses us, but actually um, either we know nothing about it or others know nothing about it at all? Is it enough to be used by God or are we doing it to be noticed? God has stuff for us to do. It may get the spotlight. It might be hidden. We might not even know the impact that we're having, yet God has called us to go. 
It doesn't matter if what we do is only known by us or not even by us. If God asks us to do things, then it doesn't matter who knows about it. It matters that God is asking and that we go. So in conclusion, from James, we learn that we need to remain faithful even in the midst of suffering. We need to trust that God knows what he's doing and that he can work in these situations. We may never know what he's up to, but God is at work. From Herod, we learn that ultimately God is vindicated. That if we follow him, we will be shown to be in the right. That whatever we go through, it's worth it. That ultimately the only declaration, the only verdict that matters is God's. But in the fullness of time and eternity, it will also be clear to all. From Peter, we learn that when God has a purpose for us, it's not a matter of who sees it. Sometimes even when we don't see what is going on, but that doesn't matter. Trust God as we follow him and he will work through us. God can surprise us and sometimes we'll see his power at work and sometimes it will remain hidden. But that doesn't mean it's not God that, w that is working in what we are doing. And then we need to have a little bit more faith that God will intervene, that God is moving in the world. And we need to have that dialogue with God, that conversation about how we would like God to act and how God would like us to act. So the questions. First one, same as always. What stands out to, out to you from today's scripture and or talk? And then three questions based on the three characters that we've had a look at. James, how do we remain faithful when things get tough? Herod, are there things where being are there things where being a Christian is made to seem like being on the wrong side? Peter, how important is it to know that we are making a difference? 